Is it some bracken? Is it some bark? No, it's a bird, the beautiful and enigmatic nightjar. Remarkably camouflaged, a little bit weird. Big eyes, tiny beak, oh, how rude. It's no time to yawn. Welcome to Spring Watch. Welcome to Spring Watch 2023, coming to you live from the beautiful RSPB Arn Reserve in Dorset. And we're going to be here for three weeks. It's Monday to Thursday, a festival of wildlife for you. We start a bit early tonight, 7.30, but we'll be back to our typical time of 8 o'clock from now on. Now, we're going to be bringing you the very best of British wildlife, not just from here in Dorset, but from all around the UK. And I can promise you we've got some sensational stuff tonight. Dancing night jars, ruby-tailed wasps, sexy sand lizards, honestly. <laughs> Fantastic stuff. So much to look forward to, but look at this. Blue sky, oh. that thing in the sky is called the sun. We've packed away our thermals. We're bouncing into spring. We're feeling lively. I think this is the first spring watch that it hasn't been a miserable start. So this is certainly something to celebrate. As Chris said, we're at a new site, RSPB Arn. It's in the South Dorset coast. And you can see there, it's nestled between Weymouth and Bournemouth. We've actually been here before. We were here for Autumn Watch in 2016, yeah. Winter Watch 2017, but we've never been here for spring, so we're very excited to be here. It's a fabulous place to be, incredibly biodiverse, so we're going to see plenty of wildlife. And I mean, just look at this. Look at that view. Spectacular, don't you think, Chris? Selling postcards already, are you? I've taken a picture if you want any postcards. Yeah, be one on of website. your pictures, I'm going to flog many postcards with that on it. Anyway, never mind. Um, we've already been busy, of course, setting out our remote cameras. We've got 25 out already, more to come. We can take a look at nine of them here. A range of different species, some familiar, but some highly specialised animals which are living in these particular habitats here. And one of those that we can look at in that regard is the Dartford warbler. Let's go live to our Dartford warbler's nest. Now you can just see the chicks moving at the bottom there. They're being attended by both of the adults, but not at this point in time. So instead, let's take a look at our oyster catchers. Now oyster catchers we have featured before, uh, but this nest is unusual. This is a bird that sat on, what can I say, without spilling the beans too early. Um, it's got an unusual number of eggs, a little bit more than it probably wants to have to look after. And these cameras will be running, of course, for 24 hours. We'll be watching them. Anything that happens, we'll be bringing you the action. But if you can't wait for the programme, you can watch them yourselves from 10 o'clock in the morning until 10 o'clock at night, and you'll find them on our website. That's our live cameras on the nest. Many of them are low down. A lot of them are on the ground. So let's have a bird's eye view of the reserve. 400 acres right on Pool Harbour. The RSPB opened this site in 1965. It's famous for these wide open heathlands, a threatened habitat in the UK and home to some really rare wildlife. Not just heathland though, there's ancient oak woodland, farmland, reed beds and mud flats and all of it is managed for wildlife and all are rich habitats. Dorset coastline enjoys long, warm summers, so it's a haven for not just people, but lots of animals as well. Yeah, and some of those habitats are internationally rare. Sandy lowland heath like this is rarer than tropical rainforest. And because of our proximity here to continental Europe and all of that sunshine that we keep going on about already, there are a number of species here which take advantage of this type of environment. One of them is the Dartford warbler and the woodlark, both birds that are on the northern edge of their European range. And again, the nightjar, one of those. 
The warm soils, the sand here, once it heats up, means that it's also home to a, an extraordinary range of invertebrates, beetles, spiders, and plants as well, of course. And again, I stress the fact that many of these are specialised animals of these sandy, warm, open habitats, including smooth snakes and sand lizards. And what about that male sand lizard? Honestly, Versace, forget it, mate. <laughs> you can never match the couture of a male sand lizard in May. And we'll be getting to know many of that, those animals a lot better during the three weeks that we're here. Right, let's go over to the map. Oh, I, I think oh, we've made it very oh, fairly obvious where we are. That. We're down here in Dorset. That's where Chris and I are based. But as you can see, there's wildlife all over this map because we've been filming all over the country. Puffins right up here. And we seem to have gone all the way to Scotland to film a slug. Well, why wouldn't we? <laughs> why wouldn't we? Slugs yeah. so important. We've also been after red squirrels down here, as you can see. Some otter action coming up later in the programme today. Woodpeckers to come. I'll draw your attention to this beauty over here, though. Yes, look at this. At Minsmere, this is a Chrysid ruby tail or jewel wasp, a hyper parasite, and they have an extraordinary lifestyle that we'll be learning about later in the programme. It's like a jewellery box, isn't it, with all this wildlife? And let me tell you, we've got some great films that look in wildlife in macro. So that's looking at them close up, tiny things in close up, and it's so fascinating. So that to look forward to. Now, at this point, we should be introducing you to Yolo Williams, but unfortunately, he had a health scare last week, and so he's not going to be with us for the series. But he's doing really well. He's at home with his feet up, resting with a cup of tea and no doubt some cake, watching well, the I hope it is a cup of tea and nothing stronger, Yolo. <laughs> yeah, Come Yolo, on. you've got to look Behave after yourself. yourself. There's a lot of love being sent your way on social media. So he's not with us. So the wonderful Megan McCubbin has stepped in at the last minute. And this is such a great area. It's a huge area. So she's going to be showing us all of the areas around here a little bit further afield. And Megs, it's great to have you with us. Hello. Yes, isn't it wonderful to be back? And I'm here on the other side of the Arne Reserve looking at this glorious view, which is a super national nature reserve, the first of its kind in the UK. And I'll be explaining a little bit more about that later on. It's essentially collaborative thinking in terms of conservation, getting people to work together for the benefit of nature. And that just so happens to be the series theme, all about collaboration. What could be more important than that? And over the course of the next three weeks, I'll be exploring the local area in Dorset to bring some of the best wildlife to your screens. Chris, Michaela, sunshine, does it get much better than that? It's a great start, Megs. Thank you very much indeed. But of course, it's not just about us reporting down in Dorset. I'm very pleased to say that Gillian has stretched her legs slightly further afield than us, and she is roaming around in the wonderful North Wales. And I'm sure she's going to have a fantastic time. Gillian. Well, I do feel very, very lucky to be here because I am surrounded by some of the most stunning mountains of Ereri, the mountains formerly known as Snowdonia. And I'm going to talk about the sunshine because I'm so glad it is sunny because you can see this view. Just take a look at it. It could have been hidden by cloud and mist, but it's not. And we get to show off. We couldn't ask for a better start to our journey through North Wales. And this week, we're going to be focusing on the mountain specialists that are called Ereri, their home. And Chris and Mikhail, I've got to say, I am rising to the challenge of working on my Welsh, and Ereri is my first word. That was impressive. That was impre beautiful. Looks I know. absolutely stunning it's a there. It's lovely part of the world up there, isn't it? It really is. Now, it won't have escaped your notice that already in this programme, I think we've mentioned the weather four <laughs> times. It's that British habit. But I'd like to stick with that for a moment because we've had quite an unusual spring. Cast your mind back to February. It was extraordinarily dry. In fact, it was the driest February in England for 30 years. And over the whole of the UK, we only had 45% of the rain that we typically have and it was unusually mild well then cast your mind back to March things changed really dramatically March was extraordinarily wet of course in fact I can tell you it was the wettest since 1981 and there were far less sunshine hours April well April was described by the Met Office as unsettled I think I'm frequently unsettled but we know what that means I suppose in the weather sense it was a bit of this a bit of that but now in May we finally got some sunshine the key thing and the reason we're mentioning this weather is that it will have quite a profound impact on the wildlife that we're going to be looking at over the next 
next three weeks. Sounds like you've retrained to be a weather forecaster. Well, that was a very good explanation of this spring, but but it was a mess. And I know it's one been all over the place. Bone dry. Spring. Next minute, it was flooding everywhere. You know. But now I think we've literally gone from well from a. a, a muddled spring almost straight into summer but it is still spring and we are still enjoying it and many of you are at home as well and you've been sending in your photographs and your videos to show us what you've been getting up to and please continue to do so using at BBC Spring Watch on social media. Let's have a look at some of those pictures because I think you'll like these. You like, you like foxes. Oh, I love a fox. There's a fox cub from Lee Tilly from Kempton Nature Reserve near Hampton. But you know, Chris, it almost looks no. like a stuffed No, don't animal. go there. It does. How dare you? You've it, insulted me. No, I haven't. I've said it's so around, good. It? It's so good that it looks not real. <laughs> yeah, but I, I like that a lot. What Beautiful. about this? What about this? I think you'll like this because it has a sort of monochrome look to it. This is uh, James Smith from First and Lake in Milton Keynes. I say black and white, which is that little dot of red on its head. Do you like that? Great crested grebe youngster. Yeah, I'd go for the youngster, but the adults are obviously are altogether more spectacular. But it's a super photograph. It's a photo. That's impressive. Keep splash sending them in. of red in the middle there. OK, we've started up, but uh, we've got so much more on offer this spring for you. So let's give you a little teaser of that now. As all the familiar sights, sounds and scents of spring fill the air, it can mean only one thing. Spring Watch is back. And this year we're celebrating the huge benefits to the wildlife we love when we work together to care for our wild spaces. And that's why we've come here to RSPB Arn, just one part of a much bigger picture, the UK's first super national nature reserve. And one of the most wildlife rich places in Britain. I'm out seeing firsthand how, with all this joined up thinking, the wildlife here is thriving. This spring, we'll be stretching our wings into Wales, where we'll be exploring some of the wildlife highlights. And that's not all. Springwatch has been filming across the country to uncover some of the most inspiring stories this season has to offer. Incredible journeys, new discoveries, and hard-hitting truths. We were seeing the carcasses around us of dead birds, but that silence, it was the silence. We'll have drama. This is a soap opera going on here. Definitely a soap opera. Hearing that <laughs> is a sure sign of spring. <sighs> this is a Beckstein's bat, one of the UK's rarest bats. You're kidding. And we'll find out just how resilient our wildlife truly is. This is the most spectacular of seasons. And together, we can make it bigger, bolder and brighter than ever before. Welcome to Spring Watch. What about that? All those characters that we get to know, all those behaviours that we get to understand, if that doesn't tantalise your taste buds then honestly I don't know what will. And as I mentioned earlier I'm on the other side of the Arn Reserve, about a kilometre away from Chris and Michaela, but I wanted to show you, I'm about here on the reserve, just situated there looking out over the water, but if you take a step back what you'll see is this super National Nature Reserve. It's called Purbeck Heaths National Nature Reserve and it's all about a collaboration of thinking. It's joined up partners come together for the benefit of conservation. Seven partners all together joining up. It's brilliant. This is where we really see the difference being made because obviously wildlife doesn't see borders and therefore when we remove those borders and work together then our wildlife stands in such better place. 
Now, this environment, this super national nature reserve, is home to some amazing different types of habitats. Everything from the, um, the lowland heathland to the coastal sand dunes, woodland, lakes, salt marshes. It's honestly the most biodiverse place. But the main habitat here is actually the low-lying heathland. It's actually the UK's largest, and it's got some of the best quality wet and dry lowland heathland anywhere across the UK. It's a fantastic reserve full of biodiversity, and I'm so excited to be stood in the middle of it right now. Now, historically, native species like aurochs, for example, and wild boar going back some 300 years, would have helped manage this habitat to keep this, low light, this lowland heathland kind of open and big, uh, enabling lots of very specialised species to make their homes here. But without those species, then actually what you see is a natural progression of habitat, because actually, if left undisturbed, this would turn into woodland. But because of those herbivores basically disturbing the ground, omnivores, I should say, disturbing the ground, eating lots of those shoots of trees, it enables this heathland to grow, which is really important. Now, without those historic native species, well, it could turn into woodland, which is why these people got together on the Super National Nature Reserve to think of a solution. And they invited some new employees to do their things. Things like pigs, ponies, and cattle have come on board and they are able to range over about 1,000 hectares of this 3,331 Super National Nature Reserve. And they are keeping this heathland healthy and open for some very important specialised species that are nationally rare and found nowhere else. So without these domestic species filling in the job of the native species we've once lost, we would be without some of our rarest and most important invertebrates, for example. Now, there are amazing volunteers here at RSBB Arn, and uh, I have to mention Terry Bagley is one of them. He's a fantastic naturalist and pretty good photographer, and he's very kindly shared some images with us that he's been out taking when he's been looking in the gorse, shall we say. So this is a, well, all four of them, but the, let's take a look at the Purbeck Mason wasp first. It's a solitary wasp species and it's very distinctive because it's got that banding of ivory and black and that red part on the abdomen. Uh, there's two patches on either side and there's red legs as well. I'm hoping to get a glimpse of one of those, but it is found in and around Purbeck. Now let's go to the southern damselfly. Gorgeous, gorgeous animal, reliant on slow flying heathland streams in southwest England and southern Wales. But again, it's found here, another real beauty. Now let's go to pondweed leafhopper. Now this is an old world leafhopper and is the only species known to exist solely on floating leaves. It jumps around a lot, it's a true rarity and it is restricted here in southern England. Now this, very last but not least, is the largest tiger beetle we've got in the UK. It's the heath tiger beetle and it gets up to 18 millimetres in length. Now it's a very specific specialist, it's a predator with some really important jaws uh, but actually it's, it's experienced some severe declines in the last 25 years. But here it's doing rather well and it goes to show with joined up thinking we really can make the difference for these species. Now, what Terry's very good at doing, I'm sure, and what I love to do is to take a minute, right, and sit down. So when you're out tomorrow on your, on your walk or wherever you are, sit down in a habitat. Just ignore the world around you and tune your senses in. Because when you're walking past, you often don't notice things as much as we should. But if you stop, your sight, your, your hearing and everything will become attuned to what's around you and you'll see some amazing invertebrate dramas playing out. And I know myself and Terry are not the only ones that like to do that. Some amazing volunteers over at RSPB Minsmere have done just that and found a whole new habitat too. Here at Minsmere there are something in the region of 6,350 different species. You've obviously got birds, you've got mammals, you've got so many different and diverse habitats. It's the most biodiverse nature reserve the RSPB has. So I've actually been volunteering here, actually this is my ninth year, um, which I have enjoyed every single minute. Which must mean that it's my eighth year. Yes. For me, it is going actually searching and see what you can actually find out there. And Stephen Devine discovered a habitat at Minsmere hidden in plain sight. So Digger Alley is a habitat that's actually path, basically. It's a path which for 75 years has been used by people. Their footsteps have eroded the path, they've compacted the sandy soil. You end up with a shape of path with a, a deep depression, so it's got sloping sides. If people are walking down the path, they would simply have no idea. 
of what was going on at their feet. The path is home to insects hiding in small burrows, so the couple decided to film them to find out more. This is a macro probe lens. It means that I'm right down at the burrow entrance. Uh, sit with a little power bank just to power it all and the little light on the end of the probe. Now all we do is sit wait. and wait. <laughs> <laughs> you never know really whose burrow you're actually on. It's absolutely brilliant because you just, just don't know. Here she comes, look. She's poked her head out. You can see her on the screen here, look. It's going to be either cliff mining bee or tawny mining bee, I suspect. If she comes out a little bit further, we might be able to see. Yes, yes. cliff mining bee. And she's gone. There we go. Brilliant. But the mining bee isn't the only resident of Digger Alley. This is a metropolis of busy bees and wasps that dig their homes into the side of the path, and it's where Digger Alley gets its name. Steve and Davine have recorded 58 different species, and just like every busy town, not everyone gets along. You, you'll come down in the morning and by lunchtime, everything is kicked off and there'll be fighting going on between different insects. But I've, I've got some uh, footage of a bee wolf fighting off a sand wasp who is trying to steal its burrow. Satellite flies will be diving in behind the bees going down their burrows. This is, this is a soap opera going on here. Definitely a soap opera. And it, the soap opera was absolutely brilliant. One of the stars of the Digger Alley soap is a solitary wasp, the bee wolf. A bee wolf isn't a bee, so it is a digger wasp, but it hunts honeybees. The female wasps paralyse the bees, allowing them to be safely stored inside the burrows. But they are our main digger of Digger Alley. They will dig up to a metre actually in length of burrow, and off that actually up to 30 chambers in a good season. And these tunnels don't go unnoticed by some neighbours with a sneaky streak. The jewel wasp, often called the cuckoo wasp. They'll seek out the burrows of other insects to lay their eggs in. And on hatching, the jewel wasp young parasitise the other species by eating their larvae before they pupate and emerge themselves. But Digger Alley isn't just a killing ground. For the industrious sand wasp, it's a workshop. They are incredibly strong. They can pick up ten times their own body weight. They take big, fat, juicy caterpillars and they will then carry them across the ground and then bury them in a hole, normally three or four inches deep. When they are burying the prey, they are filling it in with sand. They will then compact the sand afterwards by picking up a stone in their mandibles vibrating their wing muscles and literally tamping the sand down and they're recognised as being a species that is using a tool. They're truly amazing little creatures. It is very important to have a good insect population. Insects form the, the basis of life in many ways and to my mind uh, something like Digger Alley is as big a draw as the sand martins. Uh, everyone comes to see the sand martins, they enjoy it, the whizzing about and the calling to each other, digging the holes out and the Digger Alley beasts are doing exactly the same things and uh, people know about sand martins but they miss the Digger Alley because they're not looking for it and our the whole aim, really, is to make sure that people do see it and they do then join the dots between the sand martins digging their holes, digger alley insects digging their holes, and how joined up the whole thing is. Well, from the tiny Lilliputian landscapes of Digger Alley to these epic landscapes of mountains and river valleys and woodland and heathland, it is all here in Erori National Park. It is 823 square miles of pure beauty. It really does have it all. It has nine mountain ranges. It's got coastline, 74 miles of coastline all around this national park and 11,000 hectares of 
woodland, of native woodland, which is very much like what you can see right behind me over there. Now, today we are actually at a location called Dolbadan Castle. It is absolutely spectacular. We've got jackdaws nesting up there, but in the short time that we've been here, we've been hearing cuckoos, we've seen tree creeper, we've even heard woodpecker drumming. And we think that might be a lone male, because it's very late in the season, a lone male that's still out there looking for love. But one of the things that is absolutely spectacular is that it's just the hint of the wonderful wildlife that we hope to find while we're here in North Wales. The landscape is a truly rugged upland habitat and a precious refuge for the upland specialists, ring oozles, but also species that prefer to stay a little bit hidden, adders making the most of spring, courting, mating really beautiful behavior but here the red kite soaring above like lots of other raptors will be and it's not all about mountains here there are over a hundred lakes and rivers with an abundance of rainfall the woodland will be soaking all of that up providing habitat for these woodland specialists raising their young of course like all animals at this time of year over here and the coastline is another area to explore with rocky shores. We'll be dipping underwater just beneath the waves to see the invertebrate life here. Real biodiversity and then drawn out to the coastline where seabirds, some of our favorite seabirds, puffins, razorbills and thousands of guillemots all nesting here. It's a real spectacle and charismatic chuffs. We love chuffs. Now, sandwich terns will also be arriving here for their spring migration. The male here offering up a little price for its mate. So it's epic, it's beautiful, it's North Wales. It certainly is. Well, here at Dolbadana, you remember I said we could hear the cuckoos. And just a few days ago, just over my shoulder there, our wildlife camera operator, Steve, managed to capture some really interesting behavior. Now, cuckoos are an increasingly uncommon sight right around the country, but this is one and it's being mobbed by a pair of meadow pipits. Now, the pipits will have moved to this upland habitat this spring to breed. The cuckoo, the famous brood parasite that it is, will be looking to lay its egg in their nest. And now there is some speculation about cuckoos and whether they've evolved to mimic the predatory sparrowhawks with those barred feathers. There's still a lot of debate around that, but certainly the meadow pippers, whatever the case, got really riled up by their presence. Now, those are birds that come here for the spring and the summer, but there is one tiny little invertebrate that sticks around for the whole year, and it's found nowhere else in the country but in the slopes of Ear Widva, which some people know as Mount Snowden. You can see it there. Now, beautiful landscapes, finding a needle in a haystack. These are tiny little insects, just a little bit under a centimeter, about the size of your thumbnail, and they are called the Snowden beetle. And they are absolutely beautiful, as we can see here. Also called the rainbow leaf beetle as well. You can see why, because of that beautiful iridescence. Now, they're found in scree and montane grassland. The larvae, the adults, they'll feed on wild thyme, amongst other things, and they're incredibly hard to find. We'd love to show you actual footage, but they're really hard to find. A survey back in 2016, it showed that they had 10 adults, one larvae, and that's all they had after 69 hours of painful digging around on hands and knees in that habitat. So a massive thank you to the National Museums of Liverpool and the team there that did the survey. And I really hope that the wildlife down in on is a little bit easier to find for Chris. Thank you, Julia. And I've come down here to the heart of our production village. I'm surrounded by the paraphernalia and technology of television. All of this is linked together by no less than 20 kilometers of 24 core fiber optic cable. And of course, we're doing everything we can to be green. So we've got 12 solar powered battery packs out here. And all of the energy that's running this is hydrogen. So we are using 0.75 grams per second of hydrogen, the byproduct being water and I can tell you and I'm bragging now of course that to date we've saved more than 10,000 kilograms of carbon dioxide going into the atmosphere. Green credentials are looking good here at Spring Watch but let's head into mission control because it's in here that we have all of our screens 
that have feeds from those remote cameras. And this is the main body of them here. Look at that, that's an impressive array. There are a few gaps at the moment and we'll hope to plug those, of course, throughout the course of the series. Not just a hive of technological activity in here, but human activity too. We've got Joe here and Ian, our camera operators, you've met them before. Jack and the rest of the team down here are story developers. And these guys are watching these cameras 24 hours a day. If anything happens here, we can record it analyze it and you'll get to see it of course so let's take a look at what we've got here now joe anything live happening at the moment yeah the, the buzzards um just being fed oh yeah okay let's go live nice. to the buzzard then we've got that there at the moment so they're f any idea what it's feeding some small mammal i'd say small mammal in there at the moment cracking view Again, though loads of food loads of food loads and loads of food yeah Fantastic. The light's gorgeous, isn't it? Absolutely stunning. We've been watching this nest, though, over the last few days, and there's been some quite unusual behaviour. Now, in birds like eagles, golden eagles, you very often see one large chick and then one smaller chick, and the larger one will be bullying the small one. But here, look at this in this buzzard's nest. The larger chick is not only bullying the smaller chick, it's pushing it out of the nest. And this has been going on throughout the course of the days that we've been watching it. Now, the younger one doesn't topple to its doom on this occasion. It turns around. The instinct to get back into that nest is certainly strong. And it manages to climb back up despite the attentions of its bullying mate there. Gets back into that nest. And I can say that it's still there at the moment. But this sort of behaviour is not commonly seen in buzzards. We've also been watching them feeding. This gives us a fantastic opportunity, of course, to look into these birds' diets. And what we've noticed here is, look, this. So this is a buzzard bringing in a male sand lizard. Then it arrives with a slow worm. And now it's arrived with a grass snake, three of the six reptile species that we have here. Now, the grass snakes we've seen being fed to young buzzards before when we were up at Innes here. But again, being able to watch these nests throughout the course of the day reveals some extraordinary behaviour. Now, we noticed this again this morning. Joe, can we go live to our missile thrush? We can. So here's the missile thrush nest. Look very carefully into the fork of that tree. It's well camouflaged with lichen. And if we push in there, Joe, you'll see that there's not a lot of activity. That's a shame, because this was going to be our first opportunity of bringing you a live missile thrush's nest. But I'm afraid that this morning, things changed rather radically. Let's take a look at that. So we think that there was just one adult here feeding the young. Now, missile thrushes, when they are normally near their nest, are very vocal, always good at chasing away predators, magpie, squirrels, that sort of thing. But this single parent might have been struggling. Bringing in food, as you've seen, and doing some brooding duties. But of course, brooding versus feeding. There's always going to be a dilemma there for a single parent. And the missile thrush left the nest carrying a dead youngster this morning. Could have died of starvation, not enough food. Could have died of chilling, not enough brooding. But then later on this morning, look. Absent parent, in comes a predator. It's a jay in this case. Takes one of the chicks, the other one falls out of the nest, and then a little while later, it comes back and takes that last egg. So sad scenes there for the missile thrush. The bird came back, checked out its nest, did a bit of brooding, and then, of course, it's, it's left. But Things are happier over at our nightjar's nest. Joe, can we get, let's have a look at that. Now, look at that wide shot of the nightjar. It's a case of spot the bird, isn't it? Now, you know it's in the centre, but look at the remarkably cryptic plumage. So the head is facing left, the tail is pointing right, but in amongst that tangle of dead and decaying gorse and heather and bracken, sitting motionless, this bird is incredibly difficult to spot. What a beauty. So good, isn't it? So good. But look, we were watching night jars last year in Norfolk, but we could only see them in the daytime. I'm pleased to say that we've got infrared cameras on these night jars here, so we'll be able to watch them throughout the course of the evening and the night. We're bound to learn a lot. And we've already seen some extraordinary behaviour. Here is the male night jar arriving back and displaying. Look at that, look at the tail waggle. The white spots indicating it's the male. 
Look at that, Jack. My thoughts on this are that it's reaffirming the pair bond. Yeah. But also, it, it could be a very specific dance to that female saying, I'm your male. Yeah, because, I mean, she'll have spent all day sitting on that nest and will be waiting for her male to come back and take her off so that she can go out and feed. And then the male does his share of the incubation. Yeah, we, well, from what we've seen, he only tends to sit there for a little bit, maybe ten minutes or so, really, in, in the two observations that we've made. Um, but that's why it's going to be really exciting to see when we get the infrared, because we'll be able to see, you know, we'll watch them through the night like we will be able to tonight. Fantastic, isn't it? OK, Joe, let's have a quick squint at our Darth Warbler. And look, they're actually coming in. Look at that. That sensational stuff. So this is one of our Heathland specialists. And that's the male. You can see that russety chest, the red eye ring on the bird there. Oh. Oh, actually, no, hold on a minute. I'm looking back here. I'm looking at the squinty That's the female bird there, actually. Yeah, Sorry. I need to get, get my eyesight sorted. Should have gone to... Um, that high street rate retailer of glasses. <laughs> anyway, look, we have seen the male at the nest. Let's have a quick look at the male, because he is altogether more attractive than that rather dowdy female. OK, so the male comes in here, and you can see, yeah, look, there we are. That's why I should go to that high street rate retailer of optical devices. <laughs> um, and there you can see a much brighter eye ring and that russet chest. Although I've got to tell you, I'm not going to start off by being too controversial, but the Dartford Wobbler might be rare and it might be a sudden speciality, but it's not very high in my charts when it comes to birds. I've always thought of them being a little bit tatty, actually, a little bit windblown and unkempt. I'm going to score them. I'm going to score them one out of ten. Megs, how would you score the Dartford Wobbler? Chris, you really should have gone and got your eyes tested because I entirely disagree with you. I mean, I'd give them maybe like a six, but then because of their story and their success story, I should add, I'd bump it up to a solid eight. An eight? Solid eight. Yeah, it's a solid eight for me. That gorgeous red eye ring. I mean, come on, they're quite beautiful. They're not scruggly to me. I think they're actually quite elegant. But there we go. That's just me and my opinion. But they are absolutely gorgeous birds. And like I said, they have been part of a really good success story. And whenever we get successes, we really have to celebrate them in the world of wildlife. Now, Dartford warblers are a little bit unusual because they are the only warbler to, warbler to stay here all year round. They are resident and they are absolutely gorgeous, gorgeous birds. They are insectivores, they primarily feed on spiders, but they'll find caterpillars and anything else they can, they can find within the, the vegetation to snack on. And they are absolutely beautiful. I think they're kind of dark and mysterious, and you often see them sat perching singing, which is really lovely. But sadly, during the 1960s, there was a really severe population crash. Now, actually, during the 60s, there were only 10 breeding uh, pairs all over the UK. All of them were only found in Dorset. Only 10 breeding pairs ever in Dorset. And then, looking at Arne, when Arne took over in 1965, they looked at where the, the Dartford Warblers were, and they found two breeding pairs. So really no, low numbers that we're dealing with. But due to a, a conservation effort and uh, the appropriate management of the land, I'm really pleased to say that actually that number is up. And last year, RSPBR surveyed the Dartford Warblers and found 92 pairs. It went from two to 92. Uh, and across the Super National Nature Reserve that I mentioned earlier, there are 300 pairs. It's brilliant and it goes to show what can happen when we all work together. From 2021 to 2022, there was a 39% population increase all over the UK. So it's a really big success story. And whenever you're out and about and you want to see a Dartford warbler, I suggest you come to a gorse bush and look up, because chances are you'll see one perched singing from the top because they have a really special relationship with gorse. Now, gorse is a fantastic bush and it's full of lots of life. Lots of spiders and invertebrates make their home here. And it is quite an impressive, albeit spiky plant, uh, but they are fascinating when you get up close to have a little look at what lives inside. Look at that gorgeous spiderweb, beautiful backlit there. Really nice. I love sticking my nose in a gorse bush because you never know what you're going to find. And I thought, actually, I might just do that now. So. I'm sat by this bush here. I'm going to put on this glove. Let's have a little look at what we can see. Now, I'm going to shake this gorse bush and see if any invertebrates fall out. There are some specialist invertebrates that like to live here. Now, the sun has gone in, so there might be not as much activity as there was earlier. No, I'm not seeing very much at the minute, but I promise you it is all in there. And to be honest, by shaking it, I've actually done the gorse plant a bit of a, a, bit of a favour because what I've done is helped with the dispersal process. 
Now what they have is these pods that are often full of seeds. This one has actually already popped and dispersed its seeds. Um, and they can produce a mature plant between 6,000 and 18,000 seeds in a year. But listen to this. Do you hear that? So on a hot day, you're walking past a gorse bush, you can literally hear the seed pods bursting and they'll disperse up to five metres. But obviously when it comes to dispersable, up to dispersal, you want to get as far away as possible from your kind of parent plant, I suppose. So gorse has come up with an ingenious way of doing that. If you look at these here, these are the seeds and you might notice this yellow dot. Now, this is called an eliosome. And essentially what that yellow dot is, sorry, the yellow dot right there, is this fat protein rich substance that attracts a certain type of ant. Well, all kinds of ants want to come and have a look at it. And what they'll do is they'll pincer it with those really powerful and quite remarkably strong jaws given their body size, and they'll take it away to their nest site. And once it's safely underground, the brood will eat the eliosome, that yellow part, leaving the seed there. That seed over time will then germinate and create a whole new gorse bush. Brilliant for Dartford warblers, brilliant for ants, brilliant for this amazing lowland heathland habitat. So critically important. I love a symbiotic relationship like that, all working together in this connective web of life. All hoping to bring back Dartford warbler, but it's time to move on from a bird that has a massive success, sorry, to a mammal that's done really rather, rather well in our waterways. Canals, once Britain's superhighways, bustling with trade and industry, are now a much more leisurely affair. They're also wildlife corridors, giving many species a route into and out of our towns and cities. Sometimes they run in parallel to a natural river, like this one in Gloucestershire. It's home to one of our most elusive mammals. Otters. They've learned to negotiate the locks, dams, and gates of the canal. They're hyper cautious of being spotted by humans, but drainage pipes and channels offer perfect places to hide. Otters are superbly adapted to a life shared between land and water. They have webbed feet, can close their nostrils and ears to keep water out, and have powerful tails which act like a rudder. They often drag their prey onto the banks to eat. An adult must eat around 20% of its body weight each day. This female needs all the fish she can get because she's got hungry mouths to feed. Two young cubs. They're around five months old and are still dependent on her for food. Otters live in underground halts, often with entrances obscured by vegetation. Here, the cubs have hidden safely out of sight while mom goes off to hunt. To be able to take advantage of the riches in both the canal and the river is a real bonus. While mom's away, back at the halt, the cubs are getting restless. The outside world is just too tempting.
while they can't yet hunt for themselves, by now they're strong swimmers and keen to explore their stretch of the canal. They're watched from the bank by a larger male otter. He's no threat to the cubs though, because he's family. He's one of the mom's cubs from last year, living independently and even catching big fish like this pike. His sharp front teeth and claws can catch and grip slippery fish in a chase. And relative to his size, that powerful bite is thought to be as strong as a spotted hyenas. Mum is back with a catch of her own. Other than when they're rearing young, otters are solitary animals, and in around eight months' time, these cubs will need to have mastered the tricks of the trade. In the coming months, Mum will teach them everything she knows and how to navigate the highways and byways of this man-made haven. Gorgeous little faces of those otters. It's always such a treat to see a family of otters and very special to see them on the canal. But I'm gonna give you another treat now. This really is something very, very special. Now, earlier on, Chris showed you some of the nests that we've got live cameras on here in RSPB Arn, and we've got a great variety already. But we've also got access to a live camera on Pool Harbour, and it's on a nest of osprey. And the star of this particular story is a bird named CJ7. And CJ7 arrived here in Pool Harbour, largely thanks to a reintroduction programme by the Roy Dennis Wildlife Foundation and Birds of Pool Harbour. And this is what happened to CJ7 last year. This female successfully mated with a male called O22. And for the first time in 200 years, Osprey successfully mated in Dorset. There were three eggs, two hatched, and one survived to when it went off on migration. And fingers crossed, it's now in Africa. It will be there for a couple of years or so, and then it will come back to Dorset. There was huge celebration because that was the first chick that was successfully bred on the south coast of England, as I say, in two centuries. Huge, huge achievement. So what has happened this year? Well, it's all looking pretty good. This is a bird that came back. This is the male. Oh, look at that handsome male. The same male from last year, 022. Just love the face of an osprey. Female arrives, but this is not the female from last year. This is not CJ7. This is an unringed female, but they're mating. It looked like they were going to be the pair that took over this nest. They started to settle down until, oh yes, CJ7 came back. Not very happy about seeing her partner mate with a strange female. It's all a bit rude, isn't it? And then the next time we looked at that nest, the unringed female had gone. CJ7 is claiming the nest and we presume mated with the original male because 24th of April, we can see that there's eggs underneath. Three eggs were laid and those eggs were laid 37 days ago. Well, 38 days ago, actually, and 37 days is the incubation period. So today should be the day that they hatch. So let's have a look at the nest live right now. There's been a lot of fidgeting. Can't see anything, we can't see whether they're eggs or chicks. Not much fidgeting going on now because this is what happened earlier on today. At 11.40, our adult bird gets up and you can see that those eggs have started to crack. Just one to begin with and then when we look closer, we could see that there were two eggs that had started to crack. Now, they take quite a while before they actually hatch. And because 
She's been sitting on them for the rest of the day. We, we haven't seen whether they've fully hatched or not yet. But this is really exciting stuff because, as I say, 200 years, we've had one successful breeding. Successful breeding now will mean that this is the second time in two centuries that we've had osprey chicks successfully bred here on the south coast. Let's go back to that nest live now and see. Oh, look, she's up. And we can see the eggs are still there. Oh my goodness, this is taking a long time, isn't it? I'm really hoping that by tomorrow we'll have three little osprey chicks there that we'll be able to follow. Really exciting stuff. And obviously, if you'd like to follow those chicks, you can do so on the live cameras. And if you'd like to know more about birds of Pool Harbour, or in fact, if you'd like to visit the nest, then all the details are on our website. Isn't it great to be able to celebrate a significant success story? This is certainly one of those moments that we can applaud. <laughs> anyway, let's go from Osprey in Dorset to Gillian in Wales. Well, welcome back to Ereri National Park. We are at the foot of Dolbadan Castle. And I am reliably told that this castle is the finest example of a round tower in Wales. And I tell you what, looking at those shots, it's really difficult to argue with that. This was built in the late 12th century and was a vital defense for the ancient kingdom of Gwynedd, an ancient stronghold for North Wales back then. Now this whole region is a stronghold for some of the Britain's most threatened um, mountain specialists. Now, this is going to be a little bit of a challenge. The Welsh name for this bird, and I'm going to take a run-up at it, is Moy Alhan Ermineth. I hope I got that right, and I hope it means what I think it means, and I haven't just said something on live TV that I shouldn't have. But I'm told it means blackbird of the mountain. And you can see why. These are ring oozles. Very, very similar to blackbirds because they're closely related a member of the thrush family and you can see really noticeably in the male that bright white collar and the feathers also have this light edging which gives the birds an overall scaly appearance. Now the birds will head up to this part of the world in the spring they arrive here in the late April early May and they migrate here from northwest Africa and also through Spain and the birds in Wales this area in Iruri has up to 70 percent in fact over 70 percent of Wales's breeding population so this area is a real stronghold for them. Now right here at the foot of the castle it's a really good opportunity to show you why they come here. It's very, very busy here, lots of tourists, heavy footfall, so there are no actual birds nesting here, but we can get into the habitat and see what they come for. So I'm just gonna climb up here, if you follow me. It is these little rocky crags, these nooks and cranny that they're looking for. And if I can get right up here, and I'll just pull this bracken back, you can see there's a little, little hole there, and you can see that is the sort of site they'll be looking for, for a nest, the perfect, ring ozel nest site, possibly. Now, in that sort of location, they're gonna feel very sheltered, very protected from predators, from weasels, from stoats, but also from the weather, because I know it's sunny at the moment, but it can get brutal up here, as I'm sure you can imagine. So that vegetation is gonna provide a perfect windbreak for them. So a nest site, the perfect nest site, is crucial for the breeding success of these birds, like all birds. And these mountains, these beautiful mountains, have an abundance of those sorts of nesting sites and habitats for these species. But I'm afraid it's not all good news because ring oozles have been on the UK red list since 2002. There's been an overall decline, especially at lower altitudes. And just last year, the park saw a decline of 30%. The reason for this isn't completely understood. It's probably a combination of factors, but certainly long, dry, hot spells like we seem to be getting aren't going to help. And this is because it affects their foraging behavior. Now, when the going is good, the birds will be out foraging. And what they're really looking for are earthworms. And we should see that here when you can see them out foraging. So they'll be looking for earthworms in the soil and they'll be digging around pulling up juicy earthworms, which make a very big part of the diet for their chicks. So really important at this time of year to be able to dig into the ground. And obviously, if they're able to feed those chicks, those chicks are going to grow strong and fledge, and that's a successful nest. However, 
that's not what we're seeing at the moment. When the going is tough, as it has been quite recently, we have had this long dry spell. It's not actually been that long if you compare it to last summer, but just listen to this. That ground is already getting really, really hard. So that's gonna be really difficult for the birds to dig into, but more than that, the earthworms are gonna burrow deeper into the soil. So the food is there, the birds just can't get to them. So these are tough times for ring ousels, but the habitat is still a great one for them. Now, a habitat that we tend to enjoy is a woodland habitat. And in the spring with the forest floor covered in bluebells, it's really hard to beat. So let's take a moment to enjoy the peace and quiet of bluebells in the woodland in our very first mindfulness moment. Mesmerizing and beautiful, eh, Chris? I mean, who doesn't love a carpet of gorgeous bluebells? I particularly like the bee. You know that close-up of the bee with the with the pollen trousers and the sound of the woodpecker. I know. Lovely mindfulness moment. That brings us to the end of the show. Tomorrow we're on at eight o'clock. What time, Chris? Eight o'clock. Eight o'clock. Make, make sure you book your place on the sofa at that time. What have we got coming up tomorrow? Well, I'll be out and about on the Heathland looking for our six UK reptiles, including this little beauty, the sand lizard. And I'll be on the lookout for some seemingly extraterrestrial plants that make their home here. And I'll be getting my hands wet and looking for some secretive animals at one of Wales's most explosive locations. And if you can't wait until 8 o'clock tomorrow night, do remember that all of our live cameras are there for you to view from 10 in the morning until 10 at night. You can find those on our website. At 1 o'clock tomorrow afternoon, Hannah Stitfall is going to be joined by Megan Crabb, author and influencer. So join her again, iPlayer. You can find that Facebook uh, as well. And remember, if you're out and about, you get any photographs, you get any video, we'd love to see those. Send those to all of our usual places. We've had a great start tonight, I think, and of course we'll be back again at the usual time tomorrow of 6.30. Oh no, <laughs> no 8 o'clock, oh, 8 o'clock, <laughs> sorry, 8 o'clock, 8 o'clock tomorrow, see you then, bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> what can we do to help nature and the environment? Well, sometimes big changes come from little actions. The Open University is exploring how simple and effective measures can make a big difference. To get inspired, visit bbc.co.uk slash bringwatch and follow the links to the Open University.